Welcome to Value-Based Care, Outcomes and Reimbursements. This is Lecture B, Consumer Understanding of Quality and Cost. This lecture focuses on the consumer's understanding of quality and cost as it relates to healthcare value. The learning objectives for this lecture are to articulate how the consumer experience can be measured and the importance of measuring it in value-based care models. Understand what HEDIS measures are and articulate how they are used by different stakeholders. Describe resources that consumers can use to find out about quality and cost of healthcare. Describe how effective these measures have been in affecting consumer behavior and some of the strengths and weaknesses of current consumer facing measures. In this lecture, we'll discuss how consumers can be engaged in order to improve the value of the healthcare they are receiving. We'll review how the consumer experience can be measured and how that is especially valuable for the concept of value-based care. We'll look at Healthcare Effectiveness Data Information Set, or HEDIS, measures and describe how consumers can use different resources to examine information about the quality and cost of healthcare and whether this has been effective in influencing consumer behavior. We'll end by identifying the key strengths and weaknesses of current consumer-facing measures. You may have noticed that in this lecture we're using the word consumer. Usually when we talk about consumers, we are referring to people who are deciding what to buy or are actually buying something. In healthcare, we make some buying decisions about the care we receive. When we make those decisions, we probably want information about cost and quality among other factors. We may have a choice between health plans. We choose which clinic to go to. If we have a planned surgery, we may choose which hospital or ambulatory surgical center to go to. At the same time, we are patients, people receiving care from our physicians and other providers and using whatever insurance coverage we have. So there isn't always a clear line between being a consumer and being a patient. But we're using the word consumer to call out that each of us is making some choices about the health care services we purchase. Let's start by looking at how healthcare consumer experience is currently measured. One commonly used tool is the Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, or CAPS surveys. CAPS surveys ask a sample of patients a set of questions about their experiences. These surveys are meant to produce more specific and relevant feedback for consumers than what might be communicated through more general ratings. CAPS measures look at areas such as the quality of communication between the patient and provider and include information that is best gathered directly from the patient. CAPS surveys also try to gather information on subjects that patients have identified as important to them. The CAPS program is overseen by the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ, which develops and maintains surveys but does not administer any surveys. All CAPS surveys are in the public domain and available for use by anyone. Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, or HCAPS, is the first national, standardized, publicly reported survey of patients' perspectives on hospital care. It is a 32-item survey administered to people who have been hospitalized. The HCAPS survey questions concern the consumer's view of her hospital experience, including communication with physicians, communication with nurses, responsiveness of hospital staff, cleanliness and noise level, pain management, communication about medicines, clarity of discharge information, overall rating of hospital, and willingness to recommend this hospital to friends and family. To see how the consumer experience can be measured and why it can be important in value-based care models, let's take a closer look at a specific CAPS survey for ACOs. CMS requires Medicare ACOs to measure the patient experience of care through the CAPS survey for ACOs. This survey has 12 care summary survey measures. The first eight summary survey measures are listed here. To better understand how the measures work, let's review the questions for the first summary measure, timely care. There are multiple questions asked for this measure. In the last six months, when you phoned this provider's office to get an appointment for care you needed right away, how often did you get an appointment as soon as you needed? 
In the last six months, when you made an appointment for a checkup or routine care with this provider, how often did you get an appointment as soon as you needed? In the last six months, when you phoned this provider's office during regular office hours, how often did you get an answer to your medical question that same day? In the last six months, when you phoned this provider's office after regular office hours, how often did you get an answer to your medical question as soon as you needed? Wait time includes time spent in the waiting room and exam room. In the last six months, how often did you see this provider within 15 minutes of your appointment time? The CAPS survey questions ask for specific feedback on each summary measure. The last four measures, shown here, are not part of the payment calculation for ACOs, but the information is provided back to the ACO. Remember that ACO beneficiaries can choose to go outside the ACO for care, so each ACO should be very interested in hearing this feedback. CMS requires Medicare ACOs to have the CAPS survey for ACOs done each year. The surveys must be done by a CMS-approved vendor. CMS also identifies the patients who will be surveyed, choosing a random sample of 860 Medicare patients who received primary care services from the ACO. The CAPS survey for ACOs generates scores at the ACO level. In other words, this survey would show you consumer experience ratings for an ACO as a whole, not for a particular physician or clinic who provides care within the ACO. For anyone who is interested in reviewing an ACO's performance on the CAPS measures, the survey results are publicly reported. As the consumers of healthcare services, improving quality and value relies on understanding the perspective of the patients. CAPS surveys are one way to gather that information. HEDIS is a set of standardized quality measurements designed to show how well health plans perform on common standards. The steward of HEDIS is a private nonprofit organization, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, or NCQA. NCQA was founded in 1990. In addition to HEDIS, NCQA engages in other quality and accreditation programs, such as certifying patient-centered medical homes. Currently, HEDIS measures are used by over 90 percent of U.S. health care plans. For 2016, HEDIS contains 81 quality measures, which fall into six domains, including effectiveness of care, access and or availability of care, experience of care, utilization and risk-adjusted utilization, relative resource use, and health plan descriptive information. In 2016, there is also a first-year measure to track the utilization of the PHQ-9, a screening tool to monitor depression symptoms as reported by patients. This measure is collected using electronic clinical data systems. The HEDIS reports are standardized and broad. All health plans report on the same measures. The measures are qualified by NCQA, so the numerators and denominators of those measures are the same for everyone, which allows for apples-to-apples -apples comparisons between health plans. However, there are criticisms that HEDIS is overly focused on process measures, as opposed to outcome measures. As we discussed in the previous lecture, quality measurement is in a state of development where outcome measures are harder to produce. For now, HEDIS measures continue to play an important role in providing a comparison of health plans. Some HEDIS data is available through subscription to the NCQA's Quality Compass tool, available at http colon forward slash forward slash www.ncqa.org forward slash HEDIS dash quality dash measurement forward slash quality dash measurement dash products forward slash quality dash compass. This can be used for comparisons with competitors and benchmarking plan performance. HEDIS provides reports that can be used by health plan buyers. Employers can look at HEDIS reports and see the overall quality of an individual plan, and then they can compare it to other health plans. However, there is a lack of employer awareness of HEDIS. Besides employers, consumers also use HEDIS reports. Consumers can access some HEDIS data through a public report, the Annual State of Healthcare Quality Report. 
HEDIS also includes a CAP survey on health plan member experience, including claims processing and getting, and getting needed care quickly. Consumer Reports magazine takes HEDIS information and provides it to consumers who are looking at buying health plans. The HEDIS reports are also used by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, to create star ratings for different insurance plans. Large state entities that contract with health plans to provide Medicaid services often use HEDIS reports, too. Here is an example of a HEDIS report. In this example, United Healthcare is the insurance provider. This screenshot is just a very small portion of the multiple screens for United Healthcare plans in the 2015 16 summary report. The report indicates that the United Healthcare plans are not the highest performers in the states in the plans that are shown. This data could be used by employers in those states comparing the results with United Healthcare in other states, or to compare with other health plans operating in their state when they are in contract discussions for the next benefit year. If the scores are low on prevention services, an employer could ask the health plan to increase employee communications around the importance of preventive services. The overall effect, if any, that HEDIS has had on the cost and quality of care is not well documented. Nonetheless, HEDIS continues to be an important standardized measurement and one of the efforts that have been made to measure quality and value of health care. The Choosing Wisely campaign is a nonprofit sector effort to reduce overuse of health care by developing patient friendly educational materials and promoting conversations between patients and providers about tests and procedures that are often overused. The campaign cites survey findings from 2014, where 72 percent of physicians said that the average physician prescribes an unnecessary test or procedure at least once a week, and 47 percent said that their patients ask for an unnecessary test or procedure at least once a week. On the bright side, 70 percent of physicians reported that if they have a conversation about the reason a test or procedure is unnecessary, the patient often avoids it. CMS launched the Physician Compare site in 2010, as required by the Affordable Care Act. It builds on the other Compare sites that are maintained by CMS, including Hospital Compare, Nursing Home Compare, Home Health Compare, and Dialysis Facility Compare. The implementation of the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, or MACRA, will allow additional quality metrics to be added to Physician Compare over time. While surveys indicate that consumers are interested in information that helps them evaluate and choose physicians, research indicates that a small proportion of consumers make use of physician rating sites that present detailed quality metrics, such as Physician Compare and those sponsored by states. As we mentioned earlier, HCAPS is a 32-item survey administered to people who have been hospitalized. Because the same survey is given to patients all across the U.S., it allows for valid comparisons. The raw data captured through the survey is used by CMS to create a consumer-friendly website to compare hospitals. The website is called Hospital Compare, and it allows consumers to look at the HCAPS data and also other data concerning safety, cost, and value, so that consumers can compare the hospitals in their region or city and see how other consumers felt about their experience. Let's look at a sample screenshot from the Hospital Compare website. The user selects the location to search, or up to three specific hospitals, to begin the comparison. Tabs across the top show a variety of categories of information to compare, such as overall patient satisfaction and value of care. This image shows how Consumer Reports takes HCAPS data and presents it so that it is easily understandable and familiar. Red circles under patient outcomes in the bottom portion of the screen mean better than average. Half-red circles are slightly better than average. Black half-circles are slightly worse than average. And black circles are much worse than average. This type of information allows consumers to look at the hospitals in their region to see how they compare and which ones they may want to go to. Information like this, whether provided through Hospital Compare or through Consumer Reports, allows informed consumers to research and find information about the cost and quality of care that hospitals provide. 
The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, or RWJF, maintains a directory of public reports focused on quality reporting. Of the 208 reports currently listed, 26 are national. The remainder have a focus on regional, state, or local providers. Most but not all of the national reports focus on hospitals. Aligning Forces for Quality, or AF4Q, a program funded by RWJF, partnered with Consumer Reports to publish special reports as inserts in three AF4Q communities to provide consumers access to performance data on local providers. A group known as the Healthcare Improvement Incentive Institute, or HCI3, does an annual report card on the transparency of quality and cost information. In 2015, for the third year in a row, most states received a failing grade for providing information to consumers on the quality of physician care. Although many states may currently be failing in these efforts, the report highlights a few communities and states as leaders, including California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, and Wisconsin. Both private not-for-profits and profit-making entities are looking at the growth of the consumerist movement in healthcare and considering opportunities to either make money or serve the mission of their nonprofit. On the right is an image from healthcarebluebook.com. The site presents consumer-friendly information that is easy to review and digest. As a consumer, the following resources can help to provide information on healthcare costs and quality. Healthcarebluebook.com, the Leapfrog Group, which does a lot of work with hospital quality and safety, private sector rating sites that are often based on a small number of ratings per provider, Insurance companies offer tools that look at the various providers in an area. For example, United Health Group has a tool called My Healthcare Cost Estimator. Patients as consumers present some real challenges. Consumers of healthcare are in a different position than consumers of cars or dry cleaning services or other things people buy. To start with, most consumers don't directly buy health insurance. This chart shows where people in the U.S. got their health insurance in 2014. It shows that only a small percentage of people, the 6% in the non-group pie wedge, bought insurance directly. 49% of consumers obtained their health insurance through an employer. Some employers offer employees a choice of plans, and so those consumers have some influence on the market. Medicare and Medicaid cover about 32% of the population. Another 2% buys insurance from public plans, offered by municipalities or states to cover a limited number of people. About 10% of people are uninsured. They either receive charity care, pay out of pocket, or don't access health care services. Though 6% of the population adds up to millions of people who buy their own insurance, which is still a relatively small percentage who are able to directly impact the healthcare market through the purchase of insurance. Consumers are increasingly bearing more of the out-of-pocket cost of their care, which theoretically should drive selection of high-value services. If we are paying for something, we want to get our money's worth, right? Consumers are paying higher deductibles in order to keep premiums lower. The percentage of health care consumers with a deductible in 2010 was below 70 percent, but increased to 81 percent by 2014, a greater than 10 percent increase in four years. In 2009, only 27 percent of people had deductibles over $1,000. By 2014, that has increased to over 45 percent. Additionally, many health insurance plans require copayments and coinsurance. A copayment is a set amount of money paid for a health care visit. Coinsurance is a set of additional charges. For example, the insurance company pays 80% of the charges for a specific service, and the consumer pays the balance. Copayments and coinsurance are becoming more common in employer sponsored plans. To gather current information about employer-sponsored health benefits, the Kaiser Family Foundation, or Kaiser, and the Health Research and Educational Trust, or HRET, conduct an annual survey of private and non-federal public employers with three or more workers. Based on the 2014 data, the results showed that 
68% of covered workers have some sort of copayment requirement for primary care visits. 23% have coinsurance. The average copayments for an in-network physician office visit ranges from $24 for a primary care visit to $37 for a specialist visit. And for hospital admissions, 65% of covered workers have coinsurance, 14% have copayments. The average coinsurance rate is 19%. The average copayment is $308 per hospital admission, and the average separate annual hospital deductible is $1,006. However, since most people don't purchase their health insurance directly, and most group health plans handle deductibles, copays, and coinsurance differently, it is very challenging for consumers to track and analyze the implications of their health care decisions. As we have reviewed earlier, there is a lack of consistent information on provider quality and cost available to consumers that would allow them to compare their options. While there may be local or state efforts, such as aligning forces for quality, most consumers may not be able to name a source to identify high-value services and providers. There is also an issue of accessibility of information, depending on health literacy, language, internet access, and other barriers. Deductibles, copays, and coinsurance are tools that can be used to minimize the overuse of medical care that we discussed in the previous lecture. Remember some of the differences between HMOs and ACOs and how they try to balance the delivery of health care services? We found that it is important to provide incentives to providers to lead to quality outcomes. However, how does consumer behavior based on cost sharing impact outcomes? Sometimes, a health plan's attempt to find the right balance between over- and under-use can backfire. A recent study found that when an employer moved its employees from a plan that had no cost-sharing to a high-deductible plan, the employees cut back on high-value as well as low-value care. Although high-deductible plans are meant to encourage price shopping, the employees did not use the price shopping tool that was provided, but simply reduced the number of services they received, including preventive care. An extensive survey conducted by Families USA in 2015 found that adults with high deductibles were more likely to forego needed medical care. 29.8% of adults with deductibles of $1,500 or more per person who were insured for a full year went without needed medical care because they could not afford to pay the deductible. As we look at value-based care, it is important to include those factors, such as consumer cost-sharing, that might have significant implications for consumer behavior and explore options to incentivize consumer selection of high-value care options. In life-threatening situations, consumers are unlikely to do the research to select health care options. For example, if you or a family member were experiencing severe chest pain, would you stop to look up the best cardiac physician or best hospital for treating heart attacks? Or would you call 911 and go directly to whichever hospital the ambulance went to? Even in non-emergency situations, elements including whether a provider accepts a consumer's insurance, location, accessibility, and personal referrals can be weighted more heavily than quality ratings when making healthcare decisions. In spite of information being available on websites like Hospital Compare, the information is not universal or all-encompassing. These are new efforts, so there isn't a tremendous amount of research. One survey article in Health Affairs found the following about the use of these sites by consumers. These sites are mostly used by consumers who were white, college-educated, and over age 45. There was little use by vulnerable populations, and only about half of those visiting the sites indicated they were likely to use the data to choose a hospital. For consumers to be able to choose high-value care, they need to approach health care decisions with clear and meaningful information about quality and cost. As we previously discussed, currently there continues to be a focus on process rather than outcome measures, and there is a lack of meaningful provider-level measures that are comparable across providers. Providers are often concerned about public reporting that attributes quality scores at the provider level, particularly if there isn't agreed-upon methodology to account for more complex or sicker patients. 
measures to track the quality and cost of care by specialty providers can be particularly challenging to compile because there is more work that is needed to be able to define and track meaningful measures for specialists. Measures also need to be given with context and explanation, so consumers can understand the measure's meaning. It may not be immediately obvious with some measures whether a higher or lower rate is better. For example, consumers sometimes understand higher hospitalization rates for asthma to mean that there was good care because sick patients weren't prevented from receiving hospital care. The Catalyst for Payment Reform, or CPR's 2013 National Scorecard on Payment Reform, revealed that 98% of health plans say they offer cost calculator tools, but only 2% of patient members actually use them. Therefore, a growing number of purchasers and employers have turned to third-party vendors in search of tools and services that engage their employees and dependents and encourage them to shop. After the last several years, independent vendors such as Castlight Health, Truven Analytics, Change Healthcare, and Healthcare Blue Book have made significant studies in developing price transparency products designed to help consumers shop for healthcare. Although the products currently available are improving in usability, for example, although some products may require consumers to search by current procedural terminology or CPT code, increasingly the products allow consumers to search by an episode of care. There are still problems with generating accurate price estimates because of problems such as varying and incomplete definitions of the episode of care. In most parts of our lives, we have access to huge amounts of information about the purchases we wish to make, and we use that information to make rapid, high-quality, informed choices. However, when faced with healthcare purchasing decisions, consumers face some challenges. Some may be a lack of information, as highlighted in a 2011 U.S. Government Accountability Office, or GAO, report that was commissioned by Congress, which stated that, Several healthcare and legal factors may make it difficult for consumers to obtain price information for the healthcare services they receive, particularly estimates of what their complete costs will be. However, Atul Gawande summarizes the issue differently. As a public health researcher and staff writer for The New Yorker, Gawande writes in the article Overkill. Doctors generally know more about the value of a given medical treatment than patients, who have little ability to determine the quality of the advice they are getting. Doctors, therefore, are in a powerful position. We can recommend care of little or no value because it enhances our incomes, because it's our habit, or because we genuinely but incorrectly believe in it. And patients will tend to follow our recommendations. Even with a wealth of information, it may still be challenging for consumers to influence a move towards value-based care, without incentives for providers to support the shift at the same time. In Overkill, Atul Gawande gives an example of how information and incentives can line up to promote quality, high-value care. He relates the story of a Walmart employee with an insurance plan with co-pays and deductibles that would make his out-of-pocket cost for spinal surgery total over $1,000. However, if the employee chooses care at an approved center of excellence, there is no out-of-pocket expense. These centers are selected based on the quality of care, low complication rates, and pricing with a bundled payment approach. It has also been found that when the providers at these centers evaluate patients who are referred for care, they find that about 30% of the referred spinal procedures are unnecessary and that other less invasive treatment options will better meet the patient's needs. Gawande recounts the story of an employee who was incentivized because of the cost to pursue treatment at a center of excellence and finally got the right care. Gawande concludes, it isn't enough to eliminate unnecessary care. It has to be replaced with necessary care. And that is the hidden harm. Unnecessary care often crowds out necessary care, particularly when the necessary care is less remunerative. Walmart, of all places, is showing one way to take action against no-value care, rewarding the physicians and systems that do a better job and the patients who seek them out. This concludes Lecture B of Outcomes and Reimbursements.
In this lecture, we explored the concepts behind the consumer's understanding of cost and quality as it relates to health care value. We explored the concept of having consumers bear more of the burden of costs through high deductibles and found that they reduce utilization, but that they also may have an overall reduction to overall health. We found that if people have to pay more for health care, they consume less of it. Just as there needs to be incentives for providers in the ACO model to provide quality care, there need to be incentives for consumers to choose high-value care so that they don't avoid necessary care, putting off important medical procedures when the cost is too high. We examined the resources that consumers have available to find out about cost and quality. In spite of sites like Hospital Compare, it is still unknown whether there is adequate availability of information to help consumers make informed choices to increase the quality and value of the health care they access. These are new efforts without enough research available at this time to determine whether consumers can drive improvement toward value-based health care based on their actions.